I know there are people that don't like me and I accepted it years ago. I'm too sensitive, I'm too opinionated, I'm not manly enough, but I found a way to express myself and it's a blessing. Skateboarders aren't meant to be confined, contained, or tethered to anything. We perceive things in a way that doesn't make sense to other people. Your favorite baseball player is the guy that hits home runs or scores for your team, but your favorite skater, it's always a little bit of a like cult of personality in who we like as skaters. Max checks a lot of boxes for like, admiring a pro skater. You're like, oh, he's fucking cool. <laughs> it's just incredible when you see someone pursuing their passion and building a space that is uh, uniquely them. It's so cool. No, he's just a genuine person, genuine skater. He's a genuine surfer. He's a genuine bike rider. If I had another son 30 or 40 years ago, I'd have wanted to be like him. I don't take any credit for who Max is as a person or what he's done in his life because he did it all himself. I mean, he worked really hard hour after hour after hour skating or with the motorcycles. But I certainly, I think he saw me working really hard too and he was like, you know, that's what my mom does. She works hard and he works hard. Leaving my house in five or 10, getting gas and heading to you. Okay, man. See you soon. Okay, cool. All right, bye. With 4Q, it's like, I like my company. I like its name. You know, custom conditioning. Like it, conditioning means like changing the way something looks, right? Or, you know, softening it or change, just changing it. Cause you know, I start with that frame and then I get a motor and sometimes the motor's in pieces and then I get wheels and I, I put this thing together and then I make parts and paint it. It's just me and there's dog hair on every shirt that I send out, you know, like I used to try to like pick it off and then I was like, it's kind of part of the vibe. I really had to learn it on my own and do it on my own and it was not popular. I don't come from a biker family. I had to work a little bit harder, I think, to kind of find my way around it. Well, first of all, it's all DIY, right? And, and of course, skating is a total loner trip. We all started skating, we were, you know, alone. We had, you know, we had friends here and there, but I mean, really, skating is all about you and your board. And that transfers to whatever you do the rest of your life. I mean, same thing, like I used to spend eight hours like trying a stupid trick when I was a kid. I'm sitting in my world by myself with my craft, doing what I do. And so to see it's the same thing. It's just him and his tools and his bikes. This is number, probably number one, probably the first thing I painted. People will be like, oh, you learned how to paint in school. And they'll, like a painter will be like, I learned in a shop from my dad. Well. I just learned to go somewhere in the evenings and like learned about materials. But in that class, it was a heated booth and it like sucked the air down and sucked the paint around the tank or car, or whatever you're painting. I went out into my driveway in the middle of winter and I got this metal flake stuff. I painted the tank, you know, it's like 50 degrees out, which is terrible paint weather, maybe forties. And I covered this whole tank in silver metal flake and I would run it into the house in front of my oven at my old house and I would like carefully put it there and I'm working on it all and I go to like tape out the design and when I peel the tape, huge chunks of the metal flake just come off, like in a skin. I saved them forever because it looked so cool. I'm not embarrassed to have this as the first one. It's, it's pretty basic, but I actually love like basic traditional jobs anyway. 
it's really slow. Like the way I build a bike or paint or anything, it, it takes me twice as long for sure. So I just want to be able to do that at my own speed and not, not feel, I don't even know if not feel judged is the right word, but just, just to be able to be comfortable doing that. It was never like team sports, skateboarding. You know, we never depended on someone else for our ability to do what we love to do. It was just us and our thing. Walnut Creek, when my dad moved there, he heard it was the cheapest place in the East Bay to buy a house, which it was. I think he bought the $30,000 house. We literally lived by the creek in Walnut Creek. But, you know, I was dealing with so many jocks, um, being a skater and all that stuff that like, I just didn't like it there. There was none of that when I went to the city with my mom. My whole family was in and around Pittsburgh and I was really close to them. The kids were really close to them and so I wanted to stay there. But his dad left and came out here and remarried and it took me a little while to get myself out here and all I knew was home was going to be where my boys were. That's where I needed to be. So right now this piece is on my loom and it, I just um, was really into doing like uh, this hot coral color with this really, really deep wine color. One of my favorite things is like where you can see it go from white to like the violet and then almost to black. But right now I'm about to put a hem in here and start weaving this. And downstairs below is the cartoon for it. It's basically, I call it my AI guy, it's like a little robot. So just fun, just really fun to do. We both have that thing, it's alone, deal with your thoughts, recognize your emotions and you know, lay it into a gas tank or sanding something or her weaving something. I, it's, it's one of the most relatable traits I have with my mom, like a sensitivity. This is my brother and her and I, and then this is just kind of a cool one of her and I way, way, way early on. He was cool, man. I mean, he was like into punk and then he just, uh, yeah, kind of like a darkness, you know? Just got in a bad motorcycle accident, lost the use of his arm. But he always battled with addiction and they were so damn close. Like, honestly, this photo kind of says it all. I'm a little off to the side. I know she misses him so, so much that she, I kind of make her talk to me about it a little bit. To lose my son and then, um, you know, you just, I mean, to then be able to say, well, what do I have in my life that is really, besides Max, what do I have that I can really pour myself into? And that's when I spent a lot of time at the loom and I did kind of change what I was doing, um, my focus. I mean, when you have, a huge sorrow in your life, I think you have to say, where's my joy? You know, where can I find my joy and get back into, you know, I, I, a reason to live? You know, you could just as easily say, well, fuck it. I, you know, I lost my son and I don't care about life anymore. So you have to define all the people that you love, that you really care about, that make you want to live, and the things that you love to do that give you a reason to live too. After the initial room that I rented in Oakland, I pretty much always lived in warehouses. And Phoenix Ironworks was such a unique place because the ceilings were, what, 40 feet high. The walls weren't solid. Like in the winter time, the wind would just go blowing in it. It was freezing. You know, I'd cook dinner, you know, make pasta dinner or something, and I'd have fingerless gloves on. When we lived in West Oakland, you know, you imagine this white family moves into a black neighborhood and they live in a, my mom said 40 foot ceilings, it's 60 foot ceilings, this big thing. You gotta 
salvage yard on one side, an anarchist piano mover on the other side, and behind you is a whole foundry. Just all day, bang, 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 you know, throughout the night and everything. The first days there was bottles thrown at our house and, you know, kill Whitey and all this shit. I mean, straight up, I was scared in West Oakland. Like, you know, I walked out of the house one day and a dude just put his pistol to my head. And he held it there and he looked at me and I was a young teen and he just wanted to see what I was gonna do. I wouldn't call it a house. It was a warehouse. It was, it was raw, you know. We started to build enough that, you know, I could have a kitchen and a bedroom. You know, after that, he started to build the ramp and he had a lot of friends that helped him do it. Here's our ramp in the, the Phoenix Ironworks warehouse when we were building it. All stolen wood. We didn't even have walls up in the house, the ramp. The ramp came first and then the rooms came second. You'd go over to the place early on and you were like, you were just so blown away. And I hate to like make it sound so base, but you're like, how the fuck is your mom so cool? You know, you're dealing with like parents that don't support you or you know, you're coming from a place where like at that time, um, you know, my father stopped. We stopped talking because I quit school to be a professional skateboarder. And you're coming from this place of like parents that don't support you and you walk into this beautiful welcoming house where she's totally supporting her son's passion by giving the greater area of their entire home to this ramp and you're just blown away. I can't imagine us not. I mean, there was never a time when I would think, like, I started skating, Max and his brother started skating, and it's like Pinto station wagon, you know, two kids and their mom or whoever, their friends, you know, bail out of the car, run to the dish, start skating. I mean, it was a part of my life too because it was a way of being with them. You know, I wasn't, I, I, I was goofy Mongo foot, so, <laughs> you know. You'd hear the wheels like coming down the street, like, you know, it'd be loud, like four or five kids skating down here. You'd hear the boards drop and then, you know, they'd come in here and they'd just skate their hearts out. I could do 30 foot backside smiths and 10 foot method airs, I would. I miss it. I love it. I don't want to label, put a label on where you can do tricks, but he does the trick, like if it's a kickflip indie, he'll, he won't like lunch. He's not like, lunch tray, whew, throw it back under. He's just like, it's to the feet, it's done, it's back in. He comes out of his tricks and gets into his tricks really sick. He was super quiet, pretty shy, but when he skated, spoke volumes, you know? That's where his language was. And fucking, it was incredible. to understand that at that time the discipline called vert wasn't really fucking cool and there was like a dozen people that did it and they did it on these like big stake platforms roll it out as a sideshow circus at the 49ers game and it's at halftime we're gonna watch the vert skaters you know what I mean the difference between vert and street in the 90s was uh, street skating was blossoming and vert skating was not, I think. And uh, street skating could be done anywhere and vert skating couldn't. Uh, therefore, street skating was more accessible to people, so there was more people doing it, even though in the 90s there wasn't a lot of people doing either one. Yeah, this was when like a lot of the vert content, I'm thinking like a Tampa Pro, and they all, it's full pads. And this maybe was before Red Bull, but it'd be like yellow shirt, sponsor, sponsor. And Max was like flannel, you know, some like Levi's, 
some like Vans shoes and look cool. And so I think that's why he always stood out. It was really weird being a vert skater in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, because I was not doing the cool thing. No one in my squad or that I ran into ever treated me like the vert skater. And they were the ones like biggest smiles and like, what's up, Shaxi? Like, what are we gonna get today? You know, you got a front side disaster or something or what? I've skated with Max more than anybody else in my life. And I was like, we have probably skated two or 3,000 sessions. But his approach was different. And he took what he saw in the streets and he took what the, the street skaters were doing at the time and he brought that into the way that he skated the vert ramp. And that was, at that time, significantly different than was going on. Jake was Jake, you know. Jake and I learned to ollie together. We learned to ollie a broomstick, a two by four. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was super into learning about Max because there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. And I actually went in and realized I didn't know quite a bit. And I didn't realize that like Jake Phelps was like a father figure in his life. And I found out about it like on camera. You know, I'm just like, whoa, what? Like, Jake's your dad? It wasn't like father-son thing at all. It was, I think, sort of more like big brothery mentor. So I can't imagine what Max went through. Jake was always my like boss I was scared of. If he called me, my heart would drop. And it just filled me with like dread and fear because he was, I worked for Thrasher. That's the boss telling you you're fucking up on any given day. I didn't know if he was gonna... Attack you or be nice? <laughs> build me up or break me down. It's t I mean, imagine having Jake skate vert with you, like that, like you, you'd have to learn. Like, damn, like, or doing it wrong and then hearing it right then sometimes, like, what was that? Or I, I couldn't even imagine some of the, the zings that went back and forth between those two. When Jake and my mom and I showed up at a like cheap restaurant in downtown Oakland, every, every fucking one turned. I remember my dad the first time he met Jake. It was kind of sick because he was like, the fuck is this? Who's this young dude? And Jake's not gonna lean for anyone. And Jake loved me, you know? And Jake was, uh, he was kind of like, his attitude towards my dad was like, if you won't, I will. You know, like I'll take him around. And Jake take me everywhere. Jake buy me a Coke. And he started looking out for all those kids. Thanksgiving, that the door's up, come on in. My mom was really cool that way. She fed people in the neighborhood all the time. You know, Mona would be like, grab him and like, let's, let's make a mac and cheese. So yeah, I, I learned from Jake and my mom, like just to kind of like look out for people. Is he gnarly? It's like a... It's a big all in, like that's big. I don't know why I thought it was short kicks. I thought I was gonna 50-50 do -50 another trick. Hello? Mark was like sweet, cute, shy. You know, he just like, I mean, I would see his drawings. Of course, he did those two figures that were on the wall. But I didn't have a much, a, a huge relationship with any of Max's friends because I let them do their thing. This is a beautiful, only Mark can do it like that, frontside Ollie. At an international sports fair in Tokyo, 1988. Did you talk about the fact that Mark Gonzalez, the godfather of street skating, the one that we all copy, right away he knew how special Max was on the vert ramp, and the two of them had this relationship that was fucking incredible. Well, this is when he was practicing his handwriting. It's really fucking cool. I think he bought a calligraphy pen and everything. You know, every, I mean, I just think about the time he spent to do this shit, and it's like such a 
honor. This is the sickest photo right here. Can you guys read it? Quick. <laughs> Rocco, the master of forgery. Writing Mark a paycheck with the big paycheck book out. You've heard a million people say it, but as skaters, we speak that secret language. And this is like, this is one of those things that like, someone would just toss this if they found it on the street, possibly, that didn't understand our culture, the creative artist, skater, freak. But like, this is all tortured love things, I believe, from his life. Um, you can trust me, I will always love you forever. And then lust tattooed on the arm. Why he would hand me this shit, to this day I'll never understand, but it's so cool looking back that, you know, Mark was shoving art down my throat. Max knew what Mark was bringing to skateboarding, and I think Mark saw how Max was applying what he was doing to this fucking vert ramp, and seeing the two of them skate and interact and shit was fucking incredible. I think there was this like mutual respect of like the greatest skateboarder ever saw in this young vert skater something else going on and they would just feed off each other. He was progressing exponentially in a short amount of time, you know? Some of the shit he was doing, like, other people weren't doing. And obviously we seen how talented he was and we're like, oh man, you gotta ride for real. And so he was, he was part of real almost in the very inception of it. Real, four star, Spitfire, Vans. I had, to me, the best sponsors. I felt like I needed to apologize to people. Like I was just so laced up in between like so many great fucking people. So in the van sometimes I'd be like, man, what am I even doing here? In his head, it, it was probably really, really tough. In his head, it was probably tough to bridge that gap, to get in that van because he was coming from a place of solitude, of skating with, again, alone or with one or two people or like a trusted friend or two. And then all of a sudden he's put in a van with six high profile skateboarders and in his head, will they accept me? You know, what's gonna happen and stuff. And he probably felt more pressure in his own brain um, because of how it came from like a place of quiet, lone, fine tuning, and then all of a sudden you're in a van or you're on a fucking stage next to like these gnarly vert guys with, you know, uh, liquid death or whatever the fuck thing they have on their helmet, you know what I mean? And he's just like, I'm gonna go, you know? So um, in his own brain, it was probably a tougher transition for him. I think it vibes people out that I don't really like to be around them that much. I like people and I like to observe people and I like to go to a good party but I'm also pretty excited to leave. And I've heard chatter, you know, I have a big head or this or that because I don't, I don't bro down. I don't take off the shirt and show the chest piece with all the boys. And I ran it by my mom and was like, do you think it's because of like that neighborhood we lived in? Cause I couldn't really just like hang out outside. And she said something interesting. She was like, no, it's because we had the ramp in the house and you were so disciplined. She's like, you set up these barriers that protected the house when the skateboard shot off, it wouldn't like go into the kitchen or the living room. And you would like methodically set up the barriers for you and Jake to skate. And then you guys would skate from like this time to that time. I understand that. Um, I do, you know, any creative work I've ever done, well, except for ceramics, being in a ceramic studio, but has really taken the concentration and shutting the world out a little bit. And I think that's something that anybody who knows him doesn't take personal, you know? He understands that part of his process requires that he really focus. Maybe he's so different because of his isolation early on and following something that he had a huge passion for in a very isolated space. That everything else going on in skating, and he was doing this. And then building off of that space and that time and thinking who he is, and this is the way that I do a frontside ollie. I don't care what you do, this is the way I do it. 
probably led into, this is the way that I smooth this gas tank, and this is the way that I'm going to make my mark on this other thing. The transition from skating into bikes was not a plan, and it was kind of mine at first. You know, there, there wasn't a lot of light being shown on it, so I was just kind of like, man, this is so cool. And they're selling me parts for cheap and giving me stuff like, fuck, you want it? Build it. You know, those days were really amazing. You know, I think that was the attractive thing for me, cruising out of skating and into choppers, is there was just so much to learn. There was a thing in Japan called uh, Zero Engineering, this guy Shinya Kimura, and he built these really kind of low slung art deco looking choppers. So when I started this thing, I was like, man, I kind of want to do like an American version of that Japanese deco style. And I was working at a wood shop and there was a metal shop next door. And this dude, his name's Dave Riddle. He told me, he's like, anything you want to do, we can do is like the first person that was ever like, if you think of an outrageous idea, I can help you figure out how to do it. Whoever knows about Harleys, you'll hear like a Sportster is a girl's bike because it was smaller. So I never owned a Sportster, um, not because of the girl's bike thing, but I just, there is a stigma about them. And I never saw one that like ran quite right. And I never saw, men on them where I was like, man, I want to look like that. You know, I always wanted to look like the dude on the panhead. And I fell in love. I was like, man, this little bike is so much fucking fun. It does wheelies and it burns out and it's, it is, it's sporty, but they are a little bit small. And so I had this vision to build three bikes in one. This is Sportster, this is Sportster. All this shit is Sportster. The whole rear wheel, the brake, the shocks, the swing arm, but the heart of it, that this part here is all panhead. And then to make it even more confusing, instead of using a panhead engine, I used a knucklehead. Eventually with bike building, like for me, there's so many more talented people than me with much better equipment that can put it into a computer and it cuts it all out and it's like this beautiful thing. To me, it loses the handmade touch and when they start to not look like a motorcycle or like what I like, that mid-60s motorcycle, I, it just loses my interest. And it's probably slightly ignorant of me, but I just know what I like. He doesn't do things the wrong way, you know? And I think probably in every aspect of his life, like he does things the way that the people who do the things would want them done. Like he it probably builds a motorcycle the way the people who started building motorcycles intended motorcycles to be built. We might need a light, but I painted this, the flames down the side. Pinstriping is really um, something that I've always been interested in because as an artist, that was probably the only thing that I could really achieve at uh, when I was younger. I need a pinstriper. I'm a terrible pinstriper. I'm faking it with a paint pen. I cruise out to Vallejo, meet Moochie. I leave the tank there and he calls and he's like, tank's done. And I said, well, what do I owe you? And he's like, it's like a long a pause. And he's like, uh, two, two liter bottles of Mountain Dew. And I don't know if, like, I, if that's code for like two bottles of Jack. Well, he kind of reminded me of some other people that I knew. And uh, he just um, wasn't phony in any way. He actually was really uh, quite sincere. He wasn't trying to put on any airs and uh, wasn't trying to copy anybody's style or anything. He was just doing what all of us did back at that time. I'm like, hey man, I didn't bring the Mountain Dew. Like, do you really drink that shit? And he's like, no, I just, I didn't know what to say. You know, just like whatever equaled $20 or whatever in his mind. It took a few years before him and I really clicked. 
But once I realized what his motive was on motorcycles, I decided that here's a guy I want to give him all of my old motorcycle stuff. Gave him a big box of books, gave him some leathers, gave him my old cut off with all my patches and stuff on it. He just gets it. A lot of people don't get it. And he understands what it is. He's not trying to be somebody. He's not trying to put on a show. He's the real deal when it comes to riding motorcycles. I listen to a lot of Blitz, the punk band, and they have that song, 4Q, and then they're saying, fuck you. And then when I met Moochie, this is actually one of the first times I went there, he goes, uh, you have the little 4Q bike. I had 4Q on my bike too. And there's the 4Q on his oil bag. Yeah, here's my big hill skateboard. We do the serious hills with this one. Oh yeah. <laughs> You want to see want to see some sparks <laughs> this bike has been tried to be bought dozens of times and and my agreement is like I ride it to his funeral if there's a stage I put it next to his coffin if there's a parade of bikes I'm in the front on this thing that he flowed me yeah his words were I'm a tinkerer and if I keep this thing, I'm gonna fuck it up. I'm gonna make it goofy and you won't. So take it apart and make it go. I've learned a lot from Max too since uh, I've gotten back into motorcycles and he's taught me a lot. So it's kind of a two way street. And one of these days him and I are gonna get together and paint a tank, but uh, then he'll find out just how uh, irritating I am when it comes to painting tanks because I know what works and what doesn't work as far as making them perfect. And uh, I'm easy to please, I want it perfect, so. <laughs> I admire what he's done. He's understated and he always was in the sense of he would never put himself in a position of being, you know, above anyone. But his ability has outshined that tenfold because he's so fucking good. I mean, you still see, see him skate today. You know, you see the footage of him, you're like, holy shit, I know you can still do that, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I dig that. would look at Max and, and what he was creating with his motorcycles and even his skating and stuff and, and he is one of those people early on that sort of showed me to let your work speak rather than you know speak for yourself. It's like, here's the fucking work I did. I like it, it means something to me. I hope you like it. You know, I do care what you think, but this is what it means to me. And I get I take a lot of that from Max. He has vision that a lot of people don't have. He can look at something and say, okay, I can make this work. It's just gonna take a little bit of grit. And uh, that's uh, an encouragement to, to me to see somebody like him continue on with the hobby and the uh, desire to build bikes and ride bikes. And it's a lot of hard work, a lot of hours. As he grew up, he got to see, be around a lot of people that were artists, that did what they loved doing, and, and were, you know, expressed themselves through their art. So in that sense, I think, yeah, he saw that, and, but he made his art his own. He chose what his medium was gonna be. Anyone that's transferred gracefully from skating into an artistic second part or whatever chapter it is for them, hero to me. But never ever would I tell you that I would be able to just barely make a living doing this. And I love to have a space 
to be creative. And I love that with the way my body feels right now from all those years of skating, I have something that I can be passionate about. This is 4Q conditioning and it's a simple little hut where I make my shit. And that's, I hope I can continue to do it for a long time. And uh, I love it and um, that's it.